Welcome to the Cyber Center for Biblical Studies. Hi, my name is Herb Bateman. This is the first of a three-part video series of a conference we held in September 2015. It's a Let's Know the Bible conference where we invited Daryl Bach, professor of New Testament studies from Dallas Theological Seminary, to talk with us about the Gospels. More specifically, we entitled the conference, Will the Real Jesus Please Stand Up? An Examination of the Gospels. I like to rename this series as Jesus in the Gospels, How to Read, How to Interpret, and How to Understand the Gospels. And I do this in light of the way in which Daryl has broken out his discussion a little bit more precisely. Uh, he begins by talking about Jesus from the earth up versus heaven down how to read the Gospels. The next session he deals with is what got Jesus into trouble, Jesus' actions in the last week. And here, Daryl is focusing on how to interpret the Gospels. Then in his third session, he deals with minding the gap from event to Gospel orality, memory, and eyewitness. And here he's talking about how are we to understand the Gospels in right of the gap between the event and the writing of the Gospels. So in this first video, we're going to focus attention on uh, Daryl's first session. Jesus from the earth up versus heaven down. How to read the Gospels. Now throughout this presentation, Daryl will make reference to a conference booklet uh, entitled, Will the Real Jesus Please Stand Up? Uh, this booklet will eventually be available on Amazon uh, and published on Amazon. And uh, so to accompany these three videos. In the meantime, I trust that you will sit back and enjoy uh, Dr. Daryl Bach's first session entitled, Jesus from the Earth Up versus Heaven Down, How to Read the Gospels. Well, good morning, everybody. I thought when Herb was talking about the internet thing that he was going to pause and say, well, for the people who, who can't manage to make it to Warsaw, Indiana, uh, it's, it's quite a journey to get in here. I flew into Indianapolis, then drove over here with uh, two of Herb's students who I regard as grandchildren spiritually. And I told them things about Herb that they didn't know. So this is really, um, so I feel I've, I've done the equipping that I came up here to do. So it's an exciting uh, opportunity. We're going to uh, go through three lectures today. They'll be uh, each dealing with a slightly different topic. And I'm going to start off by doing an overview of the Gospels and basically deal with this question. Why do we have four Gospels? Why not one Gospel? And we'll talk about how they work. We'll talk a little bit about how they're structured and talk a little bit about each gospel. This first lecture then is just an orientation to the gospels. And then the middle lecture is going to be on what got Jesus into trouble, looking at specific details about his ministry and answering some historical Jesus kinds of questions. And then the third lecture is going to be entitled Mining the Gap. It's going to be dealing with the period between the events that are recorded and their actual recording in Gospels. What was going on in that in-between period and does it make a difference to understand what was going on there? So we'll kind of get into increasing difficulty and technicality as we move along. But this first lecture you can kick back. It's early on Saturday morning. I'm an, more of an evening person than a morning person. So this first lecture is designed to get me rolling. So, uh, so that's kind of where we're, we're working from. Why four Gospels? You know, uh, it didn't take long for the early church to say four Gospels is complicated. And so a man named Tatian in about A.D. 180 said, I have a better idea. I'm going to uh, 
put the story of Jesus in one running storyline, in one place, and kind of weave it all together. And he called this work the Dia Tesseron, which is actually a wonderful title. Um, I'm sure you all immediately know what it means. It means through the four. And in the midst of doing uh, through the four and talking about primarily the four Gospels, he tried to tell one intertwined story. We still do this today. There are, still, there are books out there called Gospel Harmonies that, uh, that often try and tell the story of Jesus in one storyline, mixing together what they think the order of the Gospels actually is. And as I spoke last night at Grace College and Grace Seminary, and I was saying, you can do that for some parts of the Gospels, but for other parts of the Gospels, it's hard to know what the exact order and sequence of events is. Because the Gospels don't always tell things chronologically. Sometimes they go topical. Uh, sometimes they move things forward to kind of give a preview of what the entire uh, period of Jesus' ministry is like. And so there are things like that going on in the Gospels that actually make telling one united chronological sequenced uh, story of Jesus kind of difficult. But we have four Gospels, I think, for uh, another even more profound reason. And that is that what four Gospels allows us to do is to get a variety of angles on Jesus. We don't have anything in the Gospels that Jesus himself sat down to write and present as a Gospel. Everything that we have in the Gospels is through the eyes of someone else. And this portrait of Jesus, these multiple portraits of Jesus actually, allow us to kind of put Jesus in quadraphonic sound. They allow us to look at Jesus from four different but related angles, and we get to see his impact, how Jesus struck other people and impacted other people, how they viewed him rather than hearing it uh, directly from himself. So it allows the opening up of possibilities. When I illustrate this, and I'll probably use a dozen sports illustrations tonight or today, um, when I illustrate this, I like to think about instant replay in the NFL. You know, we're getting ready to start the National Football League season and in big cities in the United States, that's a big deal. And so, um, and when we originally had instant replay, we only had a handful of cameras. Now we have so many cameras doing instant replay and so much technology that's involved in it, they can actually, you know, synchronize the cameras and do a whole 360 thing with the play. And, and the more angles we have, the better look we have at the exact same event. And really the four Gospels work in a similar kind of way. They're designed to give us four different discrete angles on Jesus and present uh, what it is that he is doing and what it is that he's about with a different set of concerns. And in a little bit later, I'm going to go into the differences between each of the four Gospels. But there's one other major feature that is the dominant feature between the, between the four Gospels that I want to highlight in this first hour, and it's this that three of the Gospels tell the story of Jesus from what I like to call the earth up. And what I mean by that is, is that you watch it dawn on people who Jesus is. It starts, for the most part, with categories that we're used to. And then we watch it emerge who Jesus is, and we watch people react to the emergence of that story. The synoptic Gospels, which uh, are Gospels that overlap in the kinds of things they tell us about Jesus. That's Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic Gospels. All tell the story of Jesus from the earth up. John, on the other hand, tells the story from heaven down. You know from the very first verse what John's punchline is. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God and the word was God, this is CNN. Okay, that's, that's how you start off in John. You know from the very first verse where the story is going. And it, it doesn't so much emerge, although you do watch it dawn on people, but, but he's telling you from the very prologue, from the first 18 verses, what the whole story is about. Now, why does that difference make a difference? That difference makes a difference because how you talk about Jesus and how you present him uh, is important in thinking about where most people come from in learning about Jesus. Because it's my premise that everybody learns about Jesus the same way. Everyone learns about Jesus from the earth up rather than heaven down. Here's what I mean. 
No one comes to Jesus or understands who Jesus is this way. They're born, they get the great swat of life, and, the, and this is how it goes. Wah, 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 Jesus, the second person of the ontological trinity. Wah, wah, wah. Okay, no one comes to Jesus that way. No one has an inherent understanding of all that Jesus is and the program of God and how it's wrapped up in him from, from just the instinct of being born. Someone has to sit down with them and interact with them, either through their church, through friends, uh, through what they see on television, what they see on the net. Someone has to sit down or some combination of people have to sit down and unfold for someone who Jesus is. Which means that we all learn Jesus from the earth up. But here's the irony. Generally speaking, when the church wants to tell the story of Jesus, we like to tell the story from heaven down. Think about it a second. Most people in the church love the Gospel of John because the Gospel of John does all their heavy lifting for them. And there's nothing to figure out or sort out about the way the Gospels work. And so what often happens in the church is the church struggles with how the story is told in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but the church loves the way the story is told in John because it does all their hard work for them. But in fact, most people, in order to understand who Jesus is, need to have the story told and appreciated from the earth up rather than heaven down. So I don't think it's an accident that when we look at the canon, when we look at the New Testament Gospels and the way God constructed those four works, that three of them are stories from the earth up, and only one of them is heaven down. I think that's designed to tell us something. And it also means that if you teach and preach these Gospels, it's really important to keep an eye on how the earth up story is told. What kinds of ways, what building blocks are used in order to tell the story from the earth up so that at the start I may appreciate, yes, Jesus is the Messiah. He certainly is a specially born child. But what else about him? And how does it emerge on people that Jesus is one in a gazillion? That's a big number. You know, how is Jesus one in a gazillion? How is it that he is unique? And how do they tell that story? And how does it dawn on some people that that actually is the case? And so the Gospels tell this story kind of one step at a time. And you watch the kinds of things that Jesus does more often than, more often than with the kinds of things Jesus says that help people to understand who he is. And so that's how they work. We've got three Gospels that tell the story from, from earth up, and we've got one telling them from heaven down, and it allows that variety, and they do it from a variety of angles. Now the Gospels that we have, and on the outline on one point two, on the Gospels that we have, the roots that we have in the Gospels are tied to apostolic roots, to roots beginning with the very people who walked and talked with Jesus. We have two Gospels, Matthew and John, that are associated directly with apostles. And we have two Gospels that are associated with people very close to the apostles. Mark is traditionally associated with Peter, and Luke is traditionally associated with Paul. And so the Gospels themselves have the roots of even though they were, the stories of Jesus were passed on orally for a time before they were written down, that base testimony comes from eyewitness sources and is rooted in uh, apostolic oversight that we see in the various Gospels. I'm going to talk about that especially in the third lecture when we're talking about minding the gap. Now, under the notes where you see some apologetic stuff, here is the moment that the, you know, that the seminary students are here for. So the next five minutes are for them. Okay? The rest of you can relax. Um, when it comes to thinking about the apostolic roots of the Gospels, sometimes what you hear skeptics say is something like this. Well, you know, none of the Gospels actually names the author of the Gospel in question. That's true. We don't have you know, a little signature at the end of the Gospel of John written by John, the Apostle. We don't have a little note at the end of the Gospel of Luke that says, written by Luke, um, the associate of Paul. The names that we have associated to the authorship of the Gospel are really indicated to us by two things. One is 
the internal church tradition that's been passed on about where these materials came from. And the second are notes at the beginning or at the end of the Gospels in the manuscripts that note that this is the Gospel written by, usually using uh, Greek preposition kata, uh, written by and then whoever the author is. And those notes come sometimes at the beginning, sometimes they're placed at the end of a manuscript. They are associated with the church tradition, for sure. But a man named Martin Hengel, who I actually uh, worked with when I was in Tübingen, who taught New Testament in Germany, has written a book on the one gospel and the four gospels of Jesus Christ, says that those notes, he believes, on the manuscripts, the roots of those notes, go back to the early 2nd century in terms of where they come from. Because once you got more than one gospel circulating in the church, you would need to identify before you got up to read it in the church who was the writer of the gospel. And the, and the other aspect that's going on here is that once these materials were received in the church and the apostles received this material, uh, they would have likely known who, they can, who was responsible for this gospel and why they could feel comfortable reading it in the churches. Uh, so that's one element, is thinking through the uniqueness of these titles that come with the manuscripts and their age. A second apologetic detail goes like this. I talked about one of these last night, and I'm going to talk about the other one today. Um, another skeptical take on the origins of the Gospels goes like this. We really don't know who the author of the Gospels are. They claim to have roots in two of the apostles and, two, and roots in two of the associates, but we really don't know that. Remember, we don't have a name tied to any of these Gospels, so everybody's guessing. And the early church guessed. And, and the way they brought honor to these Gospels that they were putting forward was to attach them to the name of someone of significance in order to give them credibility. That's the argument. Now, last night I used the example of Mark and Peter, and I said, let's assume that theory is in play. Okay, that the author of the gospel is not known, so it's a great X. And I have a choice, even from the, within the tradition, if we read the tradition of Papias, as recorded in Eusebius, Papias reading, writing the early part of the 2nd century, uh, recorded by Eusebius in the early part of the 4th century, about 325 A.D. Papias tells us that, that Mark got his material from Peter's preaching. Okay, that's what the tradition says. So you have a choice, and the tradition even indicates that you have a choice. You can call this gospel the gospel of Mark, or you can call this gospel the gospel of Peter. Either name might be legitimate because of the associations that the tradition is giving you. And if you think about the resume of those two figures, you've got Mark over here, okay, and here's Mark's CV. Went home to Mama after the first missionary journey caused a fight between Barnabas and Paul about whether or not to take him on the second missionary journey. Those are the two things we know about Mark. Certainly a commendation of a great church leader. All right? And on the other side, we have Peter. Okay? Primary, primary uh, among the 12 disciples, among the 12 who became known as apostles. Uh, the one who speaks instantly whenever Jesus answers a question because Peter has the gift of what goes through his mind, comes through his mouth. He does not pass go. He does not collect $200. I mean, he just immediately delivers what he's thinking. But he certainly is portrayed in the Gospels as the chief disciple. He's the one who confesses Jesus at Caesarea Philippi, etc. Now you have a choice of filling in the blank of this Acts, and you want to raise the stature of this gospel whose authorship you don't know, and you have the choice between Mark and Peter. Who are you going to pick? Well, I would submit that you'd pick without any pause or any thought Peter, and this should have been called, if that theory was right, the Gospel of Peter, but it isn't. It's called the Gospel of Mark. And I think what that indicates is actually how careful the tradition is in selecting out uh, these, these authors. I once asked uh, uh, a professor who taught New Testament at a university who was, who was known as a skeptic. He came to the meeting of the Evangelical Theological Society, and we were talking about the apostolic roots of the Gospels, and 
he's done a lot of work with Q and the Gospel of Thomas and that kind of thing. And uh, I once asked him, I said, can you explain to me why the early church chose to call the Gospel of Mark the Gospel of Mark instead of the Gospel of Peter? And his response was, that's a very good question. <laughs> so at least he was honest. I mean, I give him credit. He was honest. He understood the difficulty of the question that I was raising. And he also, I think, got the sense of the implications of what it was that I was suggesting in raising the question. Okay, that's the one I talked about last night. The one I want to talk about today, because I, I didn't talk about that other one today. No, the one I want to talk about today is the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke, and it's interesting that they, both of these involve the two that involve apostolic associates. Um, the Gospel of Luke is interesting because if you were to say that the way the early church determined the Gospel of Luke was to work through the we sections and to exclude people who otherwise are named in Acts, which is actually the way some people claim the early church determined who the author was and, and claimed to make it Luke. Um, if you go at it that way, you still have an interesting problem because you have lots of people who are mentioned in the New Testament as associates of Paul who are not named directly by name in Acts. Just to give you one example, Epaphras. Epaphras is responsible for being the co-worker who reported to Paul about the status of the church at Colossae. Okay? So he's another uh, example. And actually, if you line this up, there are about a half dozen different people who would fit that qualification. Now, granted, Silas is mentioned in Acts, and Titus is mentioned in Acts, and Timothy is mentioned in Acts, so they go out of this pool. But other people are there, like Epaphras, like Aristarchus. There are other folks. And if you didn't claim that Luke was the author of the third gospel, all that we would know about Luke is he was a companion of Paul, and he had a reputation for being a doctor. That's his CV. That's it. So here's the question. In the early tradition of the early church, the third gospel, despite all these candidates, consistently names Luke as the author of the third gospel. Despite the fact that if you pick names out of a hat of Pauline companions who aren't mentioned in what's called the we sections of Acts by name, uh, you would have a whole series of candidates. Now remember that in the early church, we're dealing with a tradition, traditions that are associated with a vast area of geography. Everything from Israel and what is today modern-day Syria all the way over to France and Spain. Okay, That's a huge area. And we're not hooked up by the Internet. So it isn't like Irenaeus can send an email to someone else and say, oh, by the way, this is the author of this gospel and, uh, and we're just going to pass it along in the church because I've let you know who the author of this gospel is. Now, this church, this tradition circulates widely and to some degree through independent streams, and yet there is unanimity about who the author is. Okay, it's Luke. And so the point that I'm trying to make with both these examples is that it looks like the tradition knows something about who these authors would be, and they're not guessing. They're not picking names out of thin air in order to enhance the status of the gospel, in order to make it more credible, or something like that. Okay, well, what about the likely order of the writing of these gospels? What order are they likely to come into? If you pick up your Bible, they're in the order Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, that's likely not the order in which they were written. There is an early church tradition that says that Matthew was the first to set a hand to the gospel, and that he did it, interestingly enough, in the Hebrew, and then the Greek word is dialect, which can mean language or style, depending on the context. And most people read it as language, because that's the normal way to use it, but a few people will read it as style. And so we've got a tradition about Matthew being the first to write a gospel, um, and he did it in, in a Hebrew, in a Hebraic context, if I can say it that way. Although the gospel that we have in our in our New Testament, the manuscripts that we have, are Greek in their, in their origin. So we've already got a translation thing going on of some kind. In other words, the gospel that Papias talks about, about being in Hebrew, doesn't look like it's completely the same thing as what we have in, in our New Testament, which is interesting. That produces a lot of discussion among scholars. 
So what many scholars will say, even though for a long time Matthew was believed to be the first gospel, in part because of what the tradition said, what many scholars think is that actually it's Mark that was the first gospel that was written down. This is in part because Mark's outline and Mark's order of events, for the most part, dictates also what you see sequentially in Matthew and in Luke. And many people go, because of that, Mark's ought to either got to be first in the sequence or last in the sequence. Because the other Gospels look to be following, in general, his order of presentation. What's interesting about that suggestion is, is that people turn around and they say, well, it's hard to think that Mark is third, that he's last, that he's simply kind of a Reader's Digest version of the other two Gospels, because the reason that sometimes gets suggested is, you know, Matthew's long, it's 28 chapters. Luke is long, it's 24 chapters. Mark's kind of short, it's 16 chapters. So maybe Mark is the Reader's Digest version, okay, or the internet inclined person's version, the Cliff Notes version of the story of Jesus that's been reduced down Okay, and made shorter and more compact. And it came last, drawing on the other stuff. But the problem that you've got with that idea is multiple. The first is that most of the places where Mark overlaps with Matthew and with Luke, he actually has longer uh, versions of the events that he tells. So it doesn't look like a Reader's Digest clipped down version. It actually is an expanded version of the stories that we get in Matthew and Luke. That looks odd. And it also are strange omissions if Mark is third. For example, perhaps the most famous speech that Jesus gave anywhere in the Gospels is the Sermon on the Mount. There's a shorter version of it in Luke that's called the Sermon on the Plain. You know, this is, begins with the Beatitudes. It's where he teaches the Lord's Prayer, that kind of thing. Well, there's not a whisper of that teaching anywhere in Mark. How can you explain that if Mark is a boil down of the other two Gospels? So for those kinds of reasons, among others, okay, many people think Mark is the first Gospel that we had written. Another source that is suggested that feeds into the Gospels is a tradition stream often named Q. At the tradition is, is that Q stands for the German word quella, which means source. And and there's a lot of discussion about what Q actually is, whether it's all a written source or it's an oral stream tradition or a combination of the two. But there are about 235 verses, give or take, um, representing about 20% of both Matthew and Luke that Matthew and Luke share of Jesus' teaching doesn't appear in Mark and it had to come from somewhere. And the other idea is, is that Mark didn't use Matthew and Matthew didn't use Mark. Again, for reasons that comparisons might suggest, the infancy material, if you look between the two Gospels, is very different in the two versions. They both have Jesus born in Bethlehem, but one tells the story of Joseph, basically. The other tells the story from Mary's perspective. Um, Matthew's infancy material has kind of doom and gloom working through it. You've got the slaughtering of the infants in Bethlehem to try and get to Jesus by Herod. You don't have anything like that in Luke. Everything in Luke is joy and praise and excitement at the birth of Jesus. The only negative note you get anywhere in those first two chapters is Simeon's remark that Jesus is going to be for the rising and falling of many in Israel, that kind of thing. So they have very different characters, and it doesn't look like they're using one another. Well, if they didn't use one another, where did this 235 verses, this about 20% of each gospel, come from that they shared? Well, it came out of the circulating traditions tied to Jesus that they both had access to. That's called Q. Now, so that's where some of Matthew and Luke's unique, uh, unique material vis-a-vis -vis Mark comes from. Um, so we have Mark as likely the first gospel. And then we've got Matthew and Luke written at about the same time. Most people put this somewhere in the 60s. Mark is also written in the early 60s. Uh, Matthew and Luke written in the later 60s is the way it works for most people. And then you've got John writing much later, doing very much his own thing. About 88% of the Gospel of John is not replicated in either Matthew, Mark, or Luke. There's very little overlap. It's almost as if John came along uh, towards the end of his life and said, I'm going to tell you kind of the 
the rest of the story are things you don't yet know about Jesus. And he works through that in great detail. So the likely order of the Gospels is Mark, and then we're not sure which came first, Matthew or Luke, after that, and then John at the end. That's generally the way the order is put forward. The order that we have in our canon, in our Bibles, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, reflects the view of Augustine, who thought that the order was Matthew, Mark, then Luke, then John. Okay, so that's, um, that's kind of some background stuff to the Gospels. What is going on in each Gospel? Let's deal with that question. Well, Matthew is really built around five discourses. And uh, um, Herb's responsible for, for doctoring up my notes, for which I am appreciative. And one of the things Herb does when he doctors up stuff is he likes charts. So you've got charts for... Every one of these Gospels, except for the Gospel of Luke, okay, which really pains me because God, Luke is my favorite Gospel. And so, so I don't know how Herb knew to make charts for Matthew, Mark, and John, and what led him possibly to exclude any chart for Luke. This is really depressing. But anyway, um, so we've got five discourses in Matthew that, that that Gospel is pretty much built around. The Ethics of the Kingdom of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 1 to 7, 29. The mission of the kingdom, that's uh, Matthew 10. That's when the disciples are sent out to inform people about the life and ministry of Jesus. The growth of the kingdom, or the kingdom parables of Matthew 13. A whole series of parables about the kingdom. That's the third discourse. The fourth discourse is life in the kingdom. This is about community life. Concludes with a wonderful parable on the importance of forgiveness to the community. And then the last one, the future of the kingdom. I like the way how he's got all the kingdom on all these. That's good, Herb. And so the future of the kingdom, also known as the Olivet Discourse, in which Jesus predicts both the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 and the signs that accompany his second coming, his return. And Matthew is built around these large blocks of discourse material, and it's designed to show how Jesus is the Messiah in the context of of Jewish rejection of Jesus. That's what that first gospel, Matthew, is about. The second canonical gospel, Mark, is a gospel of action with a call to discipleship and servanthood in the context of rejection and suffering. And what's interesting is, whereas Matthew has a lot of teaching and Luke has a lot of teaching, Mark has a lot of miracles and not much teaching. There's much less teaching in Mark. In fact, that's one of the reasons why Mark is shorter. There's much less teaching in Mark than there is action. And another thing that's going on here that's important is, when you read the synoptic Gospels, Jesus presents himself less by saying who he is than by doing stuff that points to who he is. I'm going to give you an example of that in just a minute. So, so Mark is highlighting Jesus as this... Uh, figure who's declaring the arrival of the kingdom of God. He's performing all kinds of miracles with regard to what's going on. Um, he's commenting on that here and, here and there. But he also is preparing his disciples. In fact, half the gospel deals with preparing his disciples for the fact that he will be rejected and they will also suffer rejection from a lot of people as a result of what he's doing and saying. And so the chart that, uh, that Herb has put in for Mark has to do with the three rejection uh, predictions that Jesus makes starting after Peter's confession at Caesarea Philippi and then moving as he approaches closer and closer to Jerusalem to face his death in the second half of that gospel. Mark's gospel is very much a pivot gospel. The first eight chapters present the life and ministry and reaction of Jesus with a huge section I'm going to be talking about in the next lecture about what got Jesus into trouble um, in chapter 2 to 3, 6. Just right off the bat, we're going to find out that Jesus has engendered conflict and why that conflict exists. And then we get to chapter 8 where Peter confesses that Jesus is the Messiah. They're expecting an Arnold Schwarzenegger Messiah, you know, the Terminator. Okay, he's going to bring this big victory immediately, and they're looking for that victory. And he immediately tells them, no, that's not the kind of Messiah I'm going to be. I'm going to suffer, okay, and then I'm going to come back. 
So, so the second half of that gospel from chapter 8 to chapter 16 tells the story of the movement to Jerusalem, the suffering, along with the predictions. And the emphasis is on a discipleship in a context of a world that's going to be, in many cases, hostile to what it is that you believe. Sounds somewhat familiar. So that's the Gospel of Mark. It's preparing them for discipleship in a fallen world, basically. Now, the Gospel of Luke is written to reassure its readers about the divine program in Jesus and that it's rooted in long-standing promises of God, especially in its inclusion of Jews and Gentiles together. That ethnic mix was like mixing, uh, how can I say it, gasoline and a match in terms of the way it would normally work in the culture. So the idea that you would consciously form a community that would bring Gentiles and Jews together was kind of revolutionary. And in the ancient world, the idea of something being old, uh, the idea of something being new like it is in our world today, and that being the positive thing, is the exact opposite of the way ancient world worked with regard to religion. With regard to religion, what you wanted was something that was time-tested. And so Christianity looked like it was the new boy on the block. I mean, think about this. Who works with Microsoft Word 1995 today? You don't want Microsoft Word 1995. You want Microsoft Word 2016 if you can get your hands on it. Okay? But in the ancient world, it was the opposite with religion. Religion needed to be time-tested. And so Christianity looks like it's the new boy on the block. Well, that doesn't commend it to anybody. So part of what Luke is doing is to say, no, what looks like is actually new is part of an old and long-established plan that God started back with Abraham, brought through David, promised in the new covenant. Century-old promises are now being realized. This new thing is actually very old, and having Jew and Gentile together is actually part of God's program from the beginning when he said, when he made his promises to Abraham, I'm going to bless the world through your seed. And so... So this gospel is designed to show the establishment and the age of what is going on. The last gospel, John, then what we call the heaven down gospel, attempts to show through seven signs and an examination of Jesus' teaching about his departure and his promise to bring the Spirit of God, and in that to demonstrate that Jesus is the Son of God and that faith in his name saves. So you see the chart that's tied to this gospel it emphasizes the naming of the seven signs that we get in the Gospel of John, all of which point to the unique position that Jesus has as the Son of God. And John, as I said, is, the easy, is an easy gospel because all the cards are laid out at the table from the very beginning. And John is also built around several long uh, dialogues between Jesus and the crowds. Um, there's a dialogue with Nicodemus in chapter 3. There's the dialogue with the Samaritan woman in chapter 4. There's a long discourse in the bread of life in chapter, chapter 6. There's discourses involving uh, the healing of a blind man in John 9. There's the good shepherd discussion in chapter 10. So John is built around these kind of conversations that rotate around what Jesus is doing and saying. That's different than the other synoptic gospels which tend to have short, crisp events and exchanges and not long extended dialogue materials. So that's how John is different. That's another way in which John is different from the synoptic gospels. Okay, so that's kind of our quick overview in thinking about how the gospels uh, are related to one another and a quick look at their contents. I want to deal, there's a section here called Some Key Texts, but I'm only going to have time to really to deal with one of them. I'm going to deal with the first one of these. And this is the healing of the paralytic. Now, it's my belief that sometimes what you need with a gospel is some sound, some audio-visual stuff. And so here is the healing of the paralytic, and we're going to visualize this for you, Okay. So imagine Jesus is teaching in a room full of people, and there's no room to bring anybody else in. So the next thing you hear is this, woompa, 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 woompa. The next thing that you see are little flakes coming down from above as an opening. A skylight emerges from the top. The next thing that you hear is this, uh, 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 plunk. And sitting before Jesus is now a man, a paralytic, who can't move. He's on, and, and they've laid him before Jesus, 
so that Jesus can heal him. Okay, so just visualize this with me. I'm, I'm helping the videographer by going slow. So here he is, down on the ground. Okay, and Jesus says to him, your sins are forgiven. Okay, now this is not in the text. Okay, but just think about it with me. You're this guy, and your friends have had you drop in, and you've dropped in to be healed, all right? And instead of being healed, Jesus says to you, your sins are forgiven, okay? What are you thinking, okay? Let me paraphrase it for you. That's not why I crashed this party, okay? So there's something going on here. Well, Jesus then begins to have a conversation to explain what it is that he's doing. This is commonly the way Jesus teaches. He doesn't come out directly and say everything that he's doing. He kind of shows what he does as he does it to point to who he is. And so he says this, and those of you who know the passage are very, very familiar with it. He says, and we've got the text in here in your notes, and so it says, um, Why does this man speak this way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? So the theologians who are there, theologians always have a comment on what's going on in front of them. Okay, And these theologians are no different. And so they, they theologize about what's going on. Who can forgive sins but God alone? It's actually a very accurate comment. Sets up the entire scene. Now Jesus, when he realized in his spirit they were contemplating such thoughts, let me tell you a little secret about the Gospels. Whenever anyone thinks or expresses themselves privately in front of Jesus, it's bad for the person doing the thinking. Okay? Just, it's, it's just automatic. Okay? It's bad for the person doing the thinking. There's usually some type of teaching or rebuke that follows. And that's exactly what happens here. Even though what these guys are thinking is absolutely correct, they're bothered because a human being is doing something that God should be doing. I'll let you meditate on that in your spare time. So it says, Why are you thinking such things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Stand up, take your stretcher, and walk? Now, I'm a professor, okay? I design exams that are designed to separate, okay, the men from the boys, okay, and the ladies from the girls, all right? I want an exam that's going to tell me this person is ready to go into ministry and this other person should be selling used cars. Okay? So, so that, I, I really look forward to having, you know, that kind of exam. This is that kind of question. Okay? You're separating the wheat from the chaff here. And what he's doing is he's asking a trick question that's designed to sort this out. What's easier to say? Your sins are forgiven? Or stand up, take your stretcher, and walk. Now, this is how this is supposed to work. How do you see or demonstrate that sins have been forgiven? Just think about that for a second. Okay? Uh, I'll, I'll, use, I'll use Herb as an example, okay? Because I like to pick on Herb. All right? All right. Herb, you, you hear? Am I? I thought so. Way there in the back, okay? Herb's a great guy, okay? But let's face it, Herb's a sinner, Okay? All right? He is. He's a sinner. Okay? So I say to Herb, Herb, your sins are forgiven. How do you feel, Herb? (laughs) Yeah. See? Right? All right? That's that's what I thought. Okay? He's just proving the point. Anyway, he should accept the fact that his sins have been forgiven, right? So how do you see that what I've said is true. There's no way to see it. I mean, how do anyone see things? You know, you say your sins are forgiven, you watch them fly away, and you go, bye, sin, hope you've had a great time, hope you never come back. Okay? You can't see sin being forgiven. In the meantime, I've got a paralytic in front of me who can't walk. And I say to him, get up and walk. Okay? All of a sudden, it's showtime. Okay? That's something you can see. You can see that change. And so what Jesus does is he links something you cannot see to something you can see with the assumption, which existed in Judaism, that God doesn't help sinners. Okay, So that's in the background. And it goes, But so that you might know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I tell you, stand up, take your stretcher, and go home. So when the paralytic gets up and walks, 
His walk talks. And this is what his walk says. The Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. The Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. The Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And Jesus is, and this is important, this is part of how the earth up works. Jesus is showing who he is, disclosing who he is, as much as talking about who he is. In the disclosure is the revelation. Later on in Jesus' ministry when he calms the winds and the waves. Okay, Jesus doesn't do any teaching. He just rebukes the creation and it goes calm. What's the disciples' reaction at the end of that scene? Who is this who commands the winds and the waves and it obeys him? See, it's dawning on them from the earth up who Jesus is. And there are literally a series of events like this through the Gospels that have it dawn on people who Jesus is. And basically the conclusion is, this is not, you know, neighbor Joe. There there is something unusual about this person. And we start to build these up in a variety of areas and it begins to dawn on you how unique Jesus is. That's actually how the Gospels tell the story from the earth up. And my plea would be when you work with the Gospels, particularly when you work from these earth up Gospels with Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and if you're teaching and preaching these, these stories, let the story build. How many of you when you go to a mystery movie... You know, and you're trying to figure out who done it. All right? Love the person who sits next to you and says, the butler did it. Okay? Early on in the movie. Okay? You don't like that. Okay? You want to wrestle with who did it. Now, granted, the second time through, once you know who did it and you read it back through, you start to see clues that you may have missed the first time. But part of the fun of working through the narrative story is trying to figure out who did it. Well, the Gospels... Kind of the earth up gospels kind of tell the story of Jesus this way. They watch it, you watch it gradually unfold, Jesus present who he is, and you watch people react to it. And in their reactions, you see what moves them to appreciate more and more who Jesus is and what he did, usually, versus what he says, that caused them to go there. And you begin to reflect on who Jesus is. That's the way those narratives work. We tend not to like that because we want the bottom line. I really like John, right there in the first verse. You know, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Man, I like that. That's right there, right at the front at the beginning. But in some ways, it's more interesting to work through what caused people to recognize that Jesus was different than any other human being that walked the earth. Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell you that story. And they tell it to you that way. So my exhortation to you as I wrap up is to let these Gospels unfold in the way in which they tell the story. Teach them in the way they tell the story. And it will make working, particularly with Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which are trickier Gospels to work with than with John, generally speaking, it will make those Gospels open up to you as you think about how it is that Jesus disclosed himself and how it is that it slowly dawned on people, particularly his disciples, all of who Jesus was. It will make reading the Gospels for you a much more interesting and revealing exercise. We'll be doing more with this in the next two lectures, but that's kind of the introduction. That gets us started. I hope you're waking up. If not, there's a break coming. You can get coffee, and you'll be in good shape. If I didn't do it, the caffeine will. All right? Thank you very much. Thank you for joining with us in listening to Daryl's presentation on how to read the Gospels. I trust that you will join with us in his next presentation, How to Interpret the Gospels, where he focuses on what got Jesus into trouble, Jesus' actions in the last week. Until then, have a great day.